Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about nurse innovation and heart failure socks. So I'm joined by Dr. Pam Cachion. Welcome, Pam. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So before we get started, um, maybe um, just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'm a gerontological nurse practitioner and professor of geropsychiatric nursing at Penn University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and a nurse scientist at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. All right. And so let's talk about heart failure socks. Um, where did this idea come from? Yeah, so this is uh, my first foray, foray into innovation, and it's been a lot of fun. Unfortunately, my brother, who um, was 40 years old at the time, had open heart surgery and developed heart failure following open heart surgery. He had a mitral valve replacement. And um, I was trying to help him manage his heart failure from Pennsylvania, and he was in Maryland. And like most people with heart failure, he refused to weigh himself. He just said, oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. And so I was getting so frustrated. I finally just said, show me your sock rings. And he's like, what are you talking about? I go, you know, those indents in your socks, you know, in your legs that ca are caused by the uh, pressure of your socks. Let me see those. <laughs> so we were FaceTiming over FaceTime, trying to identify how deep those sock rings were to try and figure out how much fluid overload he was having because he did develop edema with his heart failure. And that's where I just blurted out, you need heart failure monitoring socks. You refuse to weigh yourself. Let's just, this is ridiculous. And so we eventually came to an agreement on that he would start weighing himself if I would remind him early enough in the day. And we were, he's um, doing quite well now and um, back at work and doing um, quite well. But that lingering idea of uh, developing heart failure monitoring socks for other people, like my brother, Peter, who, um, really did not um, want to weigh themselves was very uh, percolated for quite some time before I finally started to uh, investigate them. I would bounce the idea off of people and they go, you need to create those. You need to do that. You And so I finally did. <laughs> okay. So before, like, before we go further, I want to explain a little bit about heart failure for people who maybe aren't as familiar with it as you and I are. Um, one of the things that happens is when people have fluid overload, the way we know that is because they have edema or swelling in their legs. And when you press on the front part of their shin, it'll leave a little indention. And so we call that pitting edema. And then depending on how big, how deep that is, it can tell you, you know, it's like the rank, the scores are like one to four, but it can tell you how much fluid overload. And if you are a heart patient, heart patient, heart failure patient, and you're taking a medication that would be a diuretic, it would relieve that fluid. And so one of the earliest indicators would be like a five or 10 pound overnight weight gain or your weight creeping up more than it should be along with the edema would be a signal that you're in fluid overload, which means you're going to have trouble breathing. It puts more stress on your heart. So that, that assessment and that monitoring is really, really important. One of the other things that we have people do is put on what we call TED hose, which are compression socks. Um, like I even have some, I've been doing so much standing at my standing desk that I actually just went and got like some compression socks um, just to prevent, you know, your fluid buildup in my own feet um, and to prevent like varicose veins anytime you stand for long periods of time. But so we recommend people put those on at the beginning of the day, you know, before you get out of bed and that prevents some of that swelling. So talk to me about what a heart, what your heart failure socks are and kind of how they work. Right. So I've prototyped uh, at least three different versions of these. Prototyping means trying out different styles and types and things like that. And a lot of what we learned from this process was that not everybody develops swelling also with heart failure. They may just develop fatigue or they might develop swelling in their abdomen rather than, or their belly rather than their legs so that it's important to um, have a sense of what else might be going on. So we've added on the second and third version of the socks, a measure for fatigue so that we're not only measuring um, 
how much swelling they have in their lower extremities or their legs, but also how much um, how their activity has changed and how much time they're staying um, sitting or with their legs elevated and things like that. So the socks actually are put on in the morning and removed at night, and they will um, monitor for activity and position sense as well as the stretch from the swelling. So we're one of the important things is the ability to be able to differentiate between swelling that become that occurs because your veins are leaking, like your veins aren't returning the blood back to the heart well versus um, swelling due to fluid overload and the seeping into the um, interstitial tissue. So we we hope to be able to develop with big data um, how the differentiation points for those, as well as the changes that occur when you're walking in the stretch and you know shape of your calf when you're walking as well. So we have to be able to differentiate those stretches in the sock as well as those related to edema. So my first. Um, my next step with these are just to actually pilot test with a very small group of participants in a nursing home to try and identify even just the procedures of putting them on, taking them off, not losing equipment and not, you know, and being able to actually upload the data from the socks. So we're just at the very early stages of participant testing. We've gotten a lot of stakeholder feedback, you know, in that empathy phase of innovation. We've gotten a lot of feedback from the process and the design of the socks, and now we're getting to the point where we're actually going to try and deploy them for a very short period of time to work out some of the details before we further test them. Okay. It's, it's very so you, fun. It's very exciting to have, uh, you know, these aren't things that I developed by myself. I had a team of engineers and big data people trying to help me think about how to um, design as well as what I would do with the information once I got it. And so we've done a little bit of just little bit of testing. Does it actually measure what we think it measures? But now we're actually going to get the procedures in place before we can actually collect a large amount of data on a large amount of people. Okay. So you mentioned, um, so you not only have the socks and it, but you have, there's something in the socks that captures the data and then it, it gets uploaded. So are these just like kind of like compression socks with like electric things in them? <laughs> like I'm just trying well, to well, like, that's, like, a good, that's a very good question. There are designs like that. These are actually I I have worked with a company um called Tevery who have developed a liquid metal stretch sensor. So it's um a very thin thread that is in a circumference around the sock. And then it's connected to an electronic device that also has a uh, measure for um, activity and a measure for position sense. And so between those three data points, the stretch of the liquid metal sensor all go into the electronic device that then we, through Bluetooth, send to a cloud so it can be analyzed. So let's talk about what progress have you made so far? Yeah, so this is our probably third or fourth prototype of the socks where we've taken them back to stakeholders and received feedback and then tweaked them again. And um, then I developed um, a relationship with Tevery, um, which is a liquid stretch metal sensor company. And so I have a company called Aging Sense. And as you know, that's my Twitter handle at Aging Sense One. Um, to really have an umbrella uh, company for some of the innovations that I'm working on, but the heart failure socks are probably the one that are ones that are furthest along, farthest along. And um, so the next step after this pilot study is to apply for STTR funding through either NSF or NIA. Um, so the National Institute Which of is Aging or the National yeah. Science Foundation. So that we will be able to do a larger study with um, a larger set of older adults with heart failure and really use the data from those to develop the decision support tool that these socks are supposed to provide. They're supposed to then, once we have the decision support set up, meaning a trigger 
based on, you know, too much swelling or you're getting too sedentary, that they would send a message to the person, a trusted other, and or their provider so that further um, analysis or assessments could be done of the individual so that it would be really um, one of the one of the things that I have not mentioned is that there are actual physiological changes that occur in patients that are heart have heart failure, particularly in the anterior cingulate, which is a portion of the brain that um, helps you recognize symptoms. And so patients with heart failure do not recognize their symptoms until they're very severe. So having a technology that helps them identify symptoms or their loved ones identify symptoms is incredibly helpful um, because they don't recognize them themselves. Um, I also wanted to add in the reason that you have this activity piece of the technology is because the way blood is returned from your feet to your heart is by walking. So I mean, <laughs> physical activity is important for anyone, but in heart failure, it's especially important. So I just wanted to kind of make that link for people because it's it, it's the socks but it, if, if you're forgetting or you can't recognize symptoms and or you're not as active then it, it can become more of a cycle so just to make yeah, that so connection a definite negative loop there for sure so um, I also did a um, small we call it the pen i core many of many universities have something like this where you actually take your idea and work with it and do at least um, for the university level, it's 20 interviews. If you do a National Science Foundation i program, it's 100 interviews. So I did 20 interviews with potential stakeholders, meaning patients with heart failure, um, nurses, nurse practitioners, other providers like physicians, um, and long-term care settings, administrators and physicians. And what I, I found is over and over again, participants with or people with heart failure did not call for help until they were in very severe, either too much fluid in their lungs and they were very short of breath or just so incredibly fatigued that they finally recognized that they were actually having trouble. So to be able to pick up on this early enough so that minor tweaks can be done, the goal would be to prevent hospitalizations and keep people at home. You know, each hospitalization costs upwards of $15,000 for heart failure. So, you know, there are 86 million people with heart failure in the United States and multiply that by $15,000. If we just prevented one hospitalization, it would really make a huge impact on our healthcare costs, as well as improve the quality of life of people with heart failure. And the key with decision support is that you don't want to trigger too often. You know, you don't, so that it's like the um, the fox crying wolf, you know? Yeah. Not the fox calling, crying wolf, the shepherd crying Sheep. wolf. What is it, the boy crying yeah, wolf? <laughs> yeah. Let me stop there. <laughs> <laughs> With the boy crying wolf, you know, you don't want to have to respond to too many signals. So the refinement of these signals or decisions and when to communicate that there may be a problem, it's going to have to be um, significantly individualized and a lot of machine learning and large data sets are going to be required to actually get to that point of being able to really influence clinical care. So I'm, I'm very excited about this particular innovation. I think it has potential to really help a lot of people. Right. I mean, I think anything that can keep you out of the hospital um, and help you monitor a chronic illness is definitely um, something we all want. So what are some next steps for you? So in this particular innovation, I am um, going to do the pilot study, hopefully over winter break and the university calendar, trying to fit in that that extra time that needed. And then um, submit what based on what I've learned from that small pilot, uh, submit write and submit an STTR, which is a business style grant. It's for a small business and um, get funding. And I am currently looking for a CEO. I need a buddy 
to keep me going on on this project. I recently interviewed someone who was very interesting, but they've gone in a different direction. So I keep my doors open if people are interested in, in working with me on this project. So it's very fun, but it's also, I have another full-time job. So it's trying to fit it in, in the midst of, you know, my other work. So I'm really exactly. enjoying it when I get to do it. So need to get back on track. So the winter break is a good, good opportunity for that. Okay. And so speaking of looking for a CEO and getting in touch with you, how are some different ways that people can connect with you um, either to learn more um, or maybe a CEO is listening. It's like, Hey, I, this sounds like <laughs> something I should do. Yeah. So um, the best way is to reach me by, by my email. I'm constantly in my email. I'm old school that way. Pamela ca at upenn, U-P-E-N-N dot edu. Um, you can also reach out to me through Twitter um, at aging sense one. Uh, and I would love to share more information and talk with you. The nice thing is I, the other thing that I've been very busy doing is pitching, pitching, pitching. Any of you who have a new startup know all about pitching. So I won um, here at the university, I won the first accelerator, um, nursing accelerator funding. So that was really helpful to get me started. And I recently won a pitch through or came in second in a pitch through the American Nurses Association and garnered some more funds. And there's, you know, you, you just always keep an eye out for these opportunities to pitch. So you have funds to keep working with your colleagues and move your concept forward. The um, So there's an AARP one that's coming up. And it's just basically, I probably pitched at least six, six times and, and been received funds in two. So it's the, I keep being reminded that it's the shots at the basket and eventually they go in. So I will continue to try and pitch this idea as well. So it's, uh, you learn something and get good feedback each time. So I really do enjoy doing that. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me um, today, Pam. And I wish you all the best um, with your heart failure socks and your um, and progress with your your progress with your company. And thank, thank you, you very much for being with me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor. And if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab, and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.